Hello, and welcome back to our Tivat audiobook series, where we read in-game text and lore so you don't have to. Today, I'm bringing you a double feature. I'm Ganymede, the studious scribe of the Hexen Zirkle, and today I'll be narrating two in-game book series, Rex Incognito and Customs of Liyue. I figured the two were appropriate to read together, and I'm rather fond of the stories of Morax's shape-shifting adventures. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Rex Incognito, Volume 1 A Liyue fantasy novel that tells the tales of Rex Lapis' incognito excursions in the mortal realm. Set in an age when the treasures of the world flocked forth, fact merges with fiction and both blend with old dreams in this charming tale set in the commercial port of Liyue. Liyue is a land where all kinds of rare and exotic treasures congregate, and where there are precious treasures, one is sure to also find those with discerning eyes. The very first owner of Shigu Antiques, the unconventional collector Min Gui, was just such an individual. Shigu Antiques of Feiyun Slope was frequented by well-to-do customers. Closed during daylight hours, it only opened to customers once the moon began to rise in the night sky. The shop's customers were anything but ordinary. They were wealthy and leisurely, people with outstanding taste. A meticulously crafted timepiece from Fontaine, incense from Sumeru, a wine goblet once owned by an aristocrat of old Mondstadt, a wooden stool whose surface was once graced by the buttocks of an adeptus for all of one hour, a delicate jade teacup from which the Lord of Geo once sipped a sip of tea. A priceless Celadon vase that Liyue's neighbor deity, the Animal Archon, once accidentally knocked to the ground, shattering it to pieces. All these and more were laid out for the customers to peruse at their leisure, each item just waiting for that one person with whom it shared a certain affinity. One night, a wealthy young man who was walking by happened to pause in front of the shop and began carefully examining the items on the shelves. The owner was struck by his long, black robes, dark and solemn as the looming mountain peaks, and by his eyes, which were the color of amber. This was no ordinary young man. Mingue could tell with one look. Welcome to Shigu Antiques, she said. Please peruse at your leisure and let me know if you find something you like. Her soft voice broke the dead silence of the night. Ah, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The young man smirked and spoke in a subtly coy manner. I'm just rather taken with this exquisite counterfeit. The item that had caught his eye was a damaged jade plaque. The face exposed to the night sky was the one on which the pattern was slightly more intact, and as the moonlight shone down, it seeped into the intricate blemishes in the jade, exposing them, and cascaded down the ravines produced by the crisscrossing texture on the plaque's surface. The severe wear and tear on the front and the disintegration around the perimeter made it impossible to discern the words and images that had once been written on it. By all accounts, it seemed to have lived a turbulent life. Counterfeit, you say? What makes you so sure? Mingue was quite used to customers making such provocative claims, but this young man spoke so bluntly and bitingly that she could not help but feel aggravated by his accusation. Added to this was the fact that this particular item had been snagged by an adventurer from an abandoned palace deep in the heart of the Abyss, who had then barely made it back out of that place alive. She recalled how she had haggled relentlessly with the adventurer to acquire the piece, and how in the end it had still cost her the better part of her fortune. If this truly was nothing more than a counterfeit, not only would it imply that she had lost an immense portion of her wealth, but it would also mean irrevocable damage to the reputation of Shigu Antiques as connoisseurs of quality. Mingue knew what she had to do. Not only must she somehow get rid of this calamitous customer who threatened to ruin her entire business, but she must also find a way to sell this jade plaque to him in the process. Please continue, she said. I would hope that you can give a detailed appraisal. As we all know, Tevat was plunged into chaos two and a half millennia ago when the gods declared war on each other. 
the ensuing conflict spreading to all people in all corners of the land. Tevat may not have been divided into the same seven nations we know today back in that age, but then, just as now, the people had their own settlements, cities, and civilizations. Gods whose names have now long since been forgotten were once venerated, worshipped, even adored by their people. Our forebearers took pearls and shells from the sea, jade from the mountains, rocks from the plains, and salt crystals from the earth, each to build idols in the form of their gods. Jade plaques of this kind are relics of that era. They belong to an ancient tribe who worshipped Rex Lapis, though, of course, the Geolord probably did not yet go by the name Rex Lapis at that time. This was an age where people watched their gods clash in bitter battles before their very eyes. Rex Lapis would not establish the currency of the Seven Nations and cast the first Mora coins for quite some time. So the tribes traded using pieces of ore they would chance across from time to time, with idols made in the likeness of the Geolord to ensure price stability. As you can see, mortal wisdom is quite a fascinating thing. They were making their own way in the world, even before Rex Lapis had made provisions for them to do so. The young man paused as if to further contemplate the observation he had just made. He stood there, cloaked in a veil of silver moonlight, which somehow served to make him ever so slightly more diminutive in stature. This type of jade plaque is a rare find in this day and age. Most of them are buried in riverbeds up in the mountains, and since each one is hand-carved, they are all unique. That is why they typically sell for astronomical prices. To claim that they are priceless would not be an exaggeration. So, it is quite a shame indeed that the one you display on your shelf is a recent counterfeit. By recent, I mean that it was probably made in your father's generation, at the earliest. There is an industry saying, the jade without blemish is no jade at all. This jade, for instance, has remarkably few imperfections, and the translucency is too good to be true, all of which points to the fact that it is unlikely to be a product of our forebears making. As a side point, I would also add that the image carved onto this jade is that of a woman. This is a highly unusual thing to see among similar relics from the era in question. The young man held the plaque up to the moonlight to inspect it in more detail. Although there are plenty of rumors to this effect, the claim that Rex Lapis once took the form of a woman is not attested to by any of the historical records, and there is no physical evidence of it ever occurring. Though young, the man had the air of an old and infuriating pedant about him. Ah, well, this is where you're wrong. Ming Gui smiled faintly, much as a fox does when toying with an inexperienced hunter. Perhaps you'd be willing to listen to my story before making your final verdict. The shop owner narrowed her eyes and began the process of reeling out her story. Volume 2, a leeway of fantasy novel that tells the tales of Rex Lapis's incognito excursions in the mortal realm. Between lofty mountain peaks where bounteous jade lies beneath, substantial ideas and empty lies are suddenly shown up side by side. Back in the age when the gods still walked upon the earth, the deity whom we now worship as Rex Lapis was but one among many. In those days, the rumor among the common folk was that the Lord of Geo was a cold and unfeeling god. His conduct was just in all things, and his judgments were rational and dispassionate, but he lacked normal human sentiment. Like the rocks, he was without warmth or softness. Despite this, people revered and placed their faith in him all the same. This was because his laws served to guarantee that trade was fair and that life was safe and orderly. The Geo Archon grew in strength and stature because of the people's belief in him. But even gods are powerless to control the beliefs and doubts of their mortal followers. And even a god who is the guardian of justice has no means of instilling the words of his rules and regulations into the heart of every individual. In Mingyun village, there was an incorrigibly irreverent jade craftsman who loved to jest. Whatever job he took on, he would complete it in the most unorthodox means imaginable and would always finish the job on the very last day before it was due. 
If the customer ordered a statue of a hunter dominating a ferocious beast, they would receive a miniature statue of a distressed boar running for its life. And when the customer demanded an explanation, he would tell them, When a formidable hunter closes in on a fierce beast, he may not show his face, but his imposing presence is enough to frighten the beast to its core. If the customer ordered a carving in the likeness of a powerful and mighty ruler, they would probably receive a statue of a majestic throne, and when asked about it, he would reply, No ruler takes the throne for more than 100 years. The throne has more longevity than he. The craftsman quickly developed a reputation as an eccentric in Mingyun village, but the wealthy merchants in the prosperous commercial port of Liyue Harbor were most amused and were only too willing to place orders with him, if only to experience for themselves what it was like to be on the receiving end of this mischievous man's antics. One night, a woman came to his workshop. She was dressed in a long, slender black gown, and her eyes shone a brilliant amber in the light of the crescent moon hanging in Liyue's sky that night. The craftsman had never met her before, but he quickly found himself in deep conversation with her. It was strange. She seemed acquainted with every vein of ore and deposit of jade in the village. She talked about the wonders of the world like they were her sisters, and spoke of jade and precious metals with a fondness one would normally reserve for their beloved daughter. The only topics she brushed over were culture, customs, and social interactions. Perhaps she was not wise to the ways of the world, or perhaps she did not wish to discuss them. Regardless, there was certainly something out of the ordinary about this woman, at least, the craftsman thought so. I would like for you to make me a jade plaque bearing the likeness of the Lord of Geo on its surface. The woman finally stated her request once the broad-reaching and lengthy conversation had reached its end, and she was all but ready to leave. But I have one condition. You may not conjure up our Lord's likeness from your imagination. You must carve the true likeness of our Lord relying on what you have seen with your own two eyes. Otherwise... She said, I'm not paying a single mora. And so a deal was struck between the two, with an agreed turnaround of three days. On the first day, the craftsman dined and drank with his good friends. He did not take a single new job on that day. On the second day, the craftsman climbed a mountain to view the jade there, not seeing a single customer or acquaintance for the entire day. Only on the third day did the craftsman close the doors of his workshop and begin carving away at the uncut jade, working from dawn to dusk until it was finally complete. When the crescent moon once again began to rise in the Liyue night sky, the amber-eyed woman returned and approached his doorstep. The craftsman proudly handed over the fruits of his labor, a jade plaque bearing the likeness of their god in female form. The woman was puzzled. She frowned and demanded an explanation, and this was the explanation that he gave. On the first day, I sought counsel from every wise and learned person that I know, and I learned the principles of our Lord and how they work, but this was just the skeleton. On the second day, I visited the mountains and spent a whole day observing the mountain rocks, listening to the ebb and flow of the elements, and pondering all that our Lord had created, but this was just the flesh. On the third day, I covered both my eyes and began to carve from the heart, starting when it felt like the time to start, stopping when it felt like the time to stop. At last, this was the spirit. But the craftsman smiled awkwardly, then added, but even I'm not sure why it came out like this. The woman tilted the item back and forth in her hand as if contemplating something. Interesting, she finally responded. Incidentally, this reminds me of another story. She looked up at him with her amber-colored eyes and began the process of reeling out her story. Volume 3, a Liyue fantasy novel that tells the tales of Rex Lapis's incognito excursions in the mortal realm. Ironclad concepts of rules or equity fade into nothingness in this fantastical tale. Liyue is a land where all kinds of rare and exotic treasures congregate, and where there are precious treasures, one is sure to also find those with a discerning eye. At the height of Liyue Harbor's prosperity, a myriad goods and treasures flowed endlessly in and out of the land like the rising and falling of tides. That age belonged, as does the current one, to the wealthy merchants and shipowners. 
It was an age in which the ones who reigned supreme were those who dared wrestle with the tumultuous tides of the market and the wrathful beasts of the ocean. Likewise, then as now, the port was constantly abuzz with sailors and laborers. Legend has it that Rex Lapis, when appearing in mortal form, does not always take the form of a distinguished gentleman fraternizing with the well-to-do of Eugene Terrace. Sometimes, it is said, he takes the form of a commoner and mingles with the miners, the fishermen, the sailors, and the peddlers. Back in that day, there was a certain fishing vessel owner who was notoriously harsh and critical in his temperament. He was always rude towards those who worked for him, and whenever something wasn't to his satisfaction, he would jump to conclusions and start scolding them, even docking their wages without giving them the opportunity to explain their side of the story. One day, this fishing vessel owner met a young man. He had just been hired by the fishing vessel owner, and his attire was indistinguishable from that of any other seafarer of the day, a loose-fitting brown shirt and trousers, and a bandana around his forehead. But from his tanned skin and the rugged, karst-like contours of his facial features, it was clear that he was a commoner from Chingsa village, who had come down from the mountains into the city in an attempt to reverse his fortunes. Like most mountain dwellers of his day, he was a simple-minded and unsophisticated fellow, but what dismayed his new boss more than this was his reluctance to go anywhere near the catches of the slimy and tentacle variety. You don't make money by being choosy. Who do you think you are, Lord of the Manor? This was the only justification the ship owner gave for docking the newly hired mountain man's pay. The youngster simply smiled bashfully and continued his work. This set the tone for many of the interactions between the two. But one day, the youngster responded instead with a question. Everyone has likes and dislikes, so why should we do the things we hate the most? The fishing vessel owner was taken completely by surprise by this random question. Incensed, he slapped his simpleton apprentice on the head and barked back at him. Them's the rules of the world, ya moron. Listen good. You'll get yourself nowhere in this world if you won't do a job that you don't like. But maybe that wasn't what Rex Lapis meant when he made the rules. Shut up, you idiot. Hmm. Maybe you'll understand better if I tell you a story. The young man's eyes shone like amber from the mountain mines in the light of the setting sun. Oh, so you're a storyteller now, are ya? At the thought of this simpleton from a sleepy mountain village telling him a story, the fishing vessel owner found himself suddenly quite curious. Go on then, but I expect you to work and talk at the same time. A mischievous smile flickered across the youngster's face and a twinkle flashed in his eye. Well then, let me tell you a story about a certain jade plaque. And so the young man proceeded to tell his tale. His boss listened so intently that he never noticed the anonymous pair of hands that were sneaking into his pocket. Hands which subsequently pilfered the money he had made from all the wages he had docked before distributing it back out to the laborers. Volume 4 a Liyue fantasy novel that tells the tales of Rex Lapis's incognito excursions in the mortal realm. In an age of reflection on the treasures of the world, one humble witticism was all it took to expose all lies. It was a time when countless exotic curios and items would flow into Liyue Harbor. This night, Mingwe, mistress of Shigu Antiques, was researching relics and narrating ancient stories with an unnamed son of nobility. The focal point of their debate was a jade plaque. As many knew, creating a counterfeit jade item was not a matter that cost much capital in Liyue. Creating a beautiful fake might be a shade more expensive, but it was a cost that most merchant houses could absorb. The real trick lay in weaving an intricate but spurious tale. Like a jade smith wandering up into the mountains, or the youth of the fisher folk whose habits are strange, those considered deviant often in fact strike closer to the heart of things. Rex Lapis laid down rules and contracts, but never forced the ordinary folk by his authority to live by them as a perfect template, for he knew that laws and stipulations were a means, not the end. The timeless balance lay, in truth, in a person's awareness and their ability to make choices for themselves. The harsh boss of the fishing vessel did not understand this principle, and so earned the fear and mockery of his hired help. As humans are, so too are antiques. 
Artistry, quality, quality and perfection are limiting factors, yes, but the worth of a relic lies in its backstory. The picky young noble seemed not to wholly perceive this idea, and so had no qualms about calling the jade plaque a fake, denigrating its value. But if all of Shigu Antique's treasures were to be scrutinized with such a piercing and empirical eye, their worth would have been ground into dust. Like the tears of a maiden for her captain, which became eternal pearls, or a mortal king who himself carved a portrait of his deceased queen before sealing his own soul into it. These stories, these legends, that should have faded with time, were preserved, and thus teemed with life under the outer husks of those relics. A fine story. I'll take this fake, then. The noble son nodded, his golden eyes smiling. After all that, you still think it's a fake? Mingwei sighed lightly. Of course. The young noble could not help but smile, and indeed had never seemed happier since entering her shop. After all, the story you told about jade plaques being ancient currency, it's nonsense. Nonsense that I made up. Customs of Liyue, Volume 1 A book on the cultures and customs of Liyue, originally compiled by Fadlan, a scholar from Sumeru residing in Liyue. It was then edited by many local scholars and published. It is one of the best sellers in Liyue. Flower Ball It is customary at weddings in Liyue for the bride to cast a flower ball towards the oncoming crowd of guests. It is said that the one fortunate enough to catch it will enjoy a year of good luck. Business owners will see their wealth increase. The poor will see their fortunes turn round. The single will encounter their fated partners. And the married will see their shared life blossom with mutual love and appreciation never again to descend into petty squabbles over life's daily vexations. While some brides use a real flower ball, many alternatives exist depending on the family's wealth. The rich tend to use woven balls with silk from the silk flower, while the poor fashion theirs from colored paper or cloth. But the custom itself is observed in the same fashion at all of Liyue's weddings, even though the fortunes of individual families may differ. Some say the Liyue custom was originally adapted from the Ludi Harpastum festival celebrated in the neighboring Wind Kingdom of Mondstadt. Others say it dates back to before the Archon War when the Salt God roamed free in Liyue. She once stood shoulder to shoulder with the many gods of Liyue, but her extraordinarily gentle nature saw her quickly ousted in the hubris of the Archon War before being ruthlessly murdered by one of her own followers. Her remains are likely to be found somewhere in the ruins of the area known as Sal Tarai. According to a legend that time has unfortunately stripped of all useful data, she once handed out bunches of flowers to her people as a blessing to them, or at least, if not a blessing, then a small gesture of comfort to stave off the bitterness of wartime existence. In any case, following her return to the elements, it is conceivable that her followers spread across Liyue, took this custom with them, and taught it to the locals. The people of Liyue being a competitive and fun-loving folk, they may have then adapted it and embellished upon it to suit their own preferences. Despite being a benign and joyful celebration at heart, security logs from the Millileth indicate that the throwing of flower balls is responsible for a significant number of injuries every year. In fact, the number of cases is more or less the same as those caused by monster attacks. Volume 2 Receiving God. Of all the celebrations, ceremonies, and customs of Liyue, none is more iconic than that held in reception of their god, the Rite of Dissension. It is during this rite that the Geo Archon, Liyue's deity and watchful guardian over the ages, descends in person upon the mortal realm to issue his divine proclamations and exhort the people to be guided by the wisdom they contain, so that all things may transpire in accordance with established rules instead of trending towards chaos. In the earliest and humblest days of Liyue's history, Liyue's farmer forebearers would elect community representatives to greet the Geo Archon on arrival and give him an appropriate send-off on departure. After making lavish offerings and reciting solemn blessings, they would listen in reverence to their divine god's predictions before announcing to the people the vision for their labor in the year ahead. 
In this way, mortals were guided along the path towards prosperity and to triumph over the obstacles that lay in their way, and thus did the domain of the Geo Archon remain strong and steadfast. When peace returned once more after the Archon War, the city of Liyue Harbor began to flourish under the government of the Qi Xing, who represented every trade in Liyue, and who also acted as intermediaries between mortals and their god, taking responsibility for communicating with the Geo Archon, explaining his divine predictions to the people in clear and simple terms, and issuing the official policy for the forthcoming year. Naturally, the illustrious individual tasked with hosting the Rite of Dissension can only be chosen from among the Qixing, and no one other than that person is permitted to intervene in the proceedings. In the minds of the many merchants of Liyue Harbor, the divine predictions of Rex Lapis are more precious than the metals and minerals of the mountain mines. Thus, no matter how far from home they may have strayed by the day that Rex Lapis descends, all will seek to make the journey back in person, or at least send someone in their place so that they may receive the guidance of the Geo Archon and safeguard their financial fortunes for the year ahead. The raving mad sages of the Nation of Rainforest drive themselves to hysterics as they abandon all that is worldly in their pursuit of elusive and esoteric wisdom. But the people of the land of Karst Cliffs are accustomed to welcoming the generous guidance of their deity as a means towards a worldly end namely, their continued prosperity. It would seem that, while the Seven stand shoulder to shoulder in their roles as Archons of the mortal realm, there are moments where their paths diverge and even run directly counter to one another. Volume 3, Silk Flowers For the well-to-do citizens of Liyue, the Silk Flower has an ubiquitous presence in their lives. It has a beautiful color, and its soft petals can be processed to make silk. It also has a most delightful scent that can survive multiple rounds of processing, and even the weaving process itself. For this reason, Liyue's botanists have cultivated a special strain for exclusive use in perfume making, with the most luxurious perfumes being offered first and foremost, of course, to Rex Lapis for his approval. For the women of Liyue, highly prized silk flower perfumes are seen as holding different symbolic meanings based on the fragrance profile and composition. The unwritten rule in Liyue is that it is impolite to broach the topic of perfume with a woman in normal social interaction, but also that if an admirer is able to correctly guess the type of perfume one is wearing, as well as correctly deduce its unique properties and characteristics all whilst conveying this in an articulate and tactful manner, the admirer is more likely to stand a chance of winning one's affection. A popular belief in the rural regions of Liyue is that the method for decoding silk flower perfume was originally taught to mortals by an adeptus living as a hermit on Mount Altsang. In the age where divine beings coexisted alongside lowly mortals, the adeptus guided humans to learn the ways of courting and romancing from the birds, beasts, and plants. To a young woman bathing in a spring, it once took the form of a graceful illuminated bird, teaching her the exotic techniques of decoding and applying fragrant oils. Who was this young woman capable of stirring the heart of an adeptus living in deliberate seclusion from the world? With countless legends offering different versions of the story, the truth is impossible to know. But the art of decoding perfume from silk flowers was indeed passed on, for it survives to this very day. It is claimed that the subtle undertones of the perfume scent and the gentle but nimble hand techniques used in the decotation process have remained unchanged throughout history on account of having proved themselves supremely fit for purpose time and time again. As they grow, silk flowers will exhibit different properties based on how their environmental conditions differ from their ancestral habitat. Liyue's merchants have coined plenty of tasteless terms for silk flowers of all types and uses, they tend to attribute them to Rex Lapis, claiming they once had the fortune to encounter him during one of his excursions in the mortal realm, or pass them off as a merciful gift from an adeptus, such details always featuring as part of a wondrous, fantastical narrative. Sales tactics like these always manage to garner the interest of a shopper or two on their way through Liyue Harbor. High demand has pushed Liyue's merchants towards the mass cultivation of silk flowers and the ongoing breeding of new strains, 
This means that the striking sight of beautiful silk flowers is a common one in all highly populated areas, including the city and the towns. Sadly, geographical changes over Liyue's long history and ever-expanding mining activity have conspired to destroy the natural habitat of wild silk flowers, meaning that the flower is all but extinct in rural areas. The handful that can still be found in the wild are carefully looked after by adepti living in seclusion there. These silk flowers feature daintier, more elegant blossoms, which puts them in stark contrast to those cultivated by horticulturists in urban centers. Interestingly, the people of Liyue see the pretty and sweet-smelling silk flower as one of the many symbols of Rex Lapis, which begs the question, has this mighty and imposing god, who typically takes a decidedly masculine form on his excursions to the mortal realm, ever taken the form of a woman and accepted a ritual offering in the form of a bunch of flowers? The sparse historical records on the one hand, and the plethora of rumors of obscure origin on the other means that, while this claim is more or less impossible to verify, it also cannot be simply dismissed as baseless speculation. On a personal note, the writer has, on one occasion, personally witnessed a statue of the Seven accept a carefully prepared and distinctly feminine gift that was presented to it in worship. As for the Geo Archon's innermost feelings upon receiving offerings from their subjects, however, this is not something that I, as an outsider in Liyue, consider myself qualified to comment on. That concludes the full text of Rex Incognito and Customs of Liyue. I hope that you all enjoyed this lighthearted return to the harbor. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next story.